Well, welcome everybody. This is Undisputed with Clay and Brenton, where pretty much anything we say can probably be disputed. This week's episode, we're going to try to keep it short and sweet uh, to the point, and we're going to hopefully have some, some good content. Uh, but let's start with the biggest headline this dropped. Uh, we normally film this episode earlier in the week, and this news just recently dropped the schedule, the 2020 schedule. So, Clay, what are you thinking? Based, what are your initial thoughts, initial reactions? What, what do you got? Uh, initial uh, thoughts, initial are thoughts are some positive, positive changes, changes and there's some negative changes. Um, I like that they kept Daytona in the first race of the year, and I think it's really cool that they made it the last race of the regular season. That's kind of a neat change, and I think it, it being the last race of the regular season is going to uh, make the the playoffs pretty interesting. Um, you know, those last minute people trying to get in. Um, Another cool addition that they've been talking about doing that they actually did was Martinsville Night Race. I think that's, yes. that's going to be pretty cool. Yep. Um, there's also another change that I really liked. Uh, what was it? Um, oh, putting um, Homestead Miami earlier in the year, as well as Fontana. Um, I really like Fontana. I'm always kind of eager for them to get there. So they've moved it up a couple weeks, which is cool. And I actually kind of like Homestead Miami, but it's always been a boring race because everybody's, you know, typically on their best behavior at that track because they're just trying to finish out the season and win their championship. Sure, right. So um, it'll be interesting to see how the racing is at, the, at that track early in the year when there's, you know, more up, up for grabs. Uh, so those are the positive changes that I saw. I saw a few negative ones. Um, uh, first, first of all, I don't like Phoenix as the uh, last race of the year. Yeah, I think, I think it's one of the most boring tracks on the circuit. And out of all those tracks, you know, Fontana, or of course, I would like to see the season end at Daytona. I think that would be a huge, a huge uh, upset for a lot of people. I think so, and I think I think that's what everybody would. Yeah, I think. It would be really fun for the fans, though. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. We'll start the season at Daytona and end it there. It makes sense to me, but the drivers would hate it. So it'll never happen. Right. But, um, yeah, Phoenix really kind of is a lame end to the season, much like Homestead was. So I don't really see where that's a really a positive change. It's kind of a negative change. And then um, they also moved, and this is just a personal problem for me, they moved Dover into August, which, you know, yeah. I, I like to go to the Dover race, and it's going to be miserably stinking hot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, sure. And, I mean, considering Indy and Kentucky and New Hampshire all in July, I mean, the fans that go to those races, they probably sweat it out too. But just personally, I didn't want to have to go there in the summertime. I like the October race. Right. Um, but just kind of looking over the schedule, if I were in control, um, I would definitely take uh, that spring Phoenix race out and take them back to old track like Rockingham. Just kind of add a little, a little bit more variety back in the schedule. Sure. And then uh, you and I have talked before about Nazareth Speedway up in Pennsylvania. They used to run there. I don't think yes. I ever went there, but um, the Bush Series did. And it was a pretty cool track. It's just, it, it's a unique shape. It's a lot, it's kind of like a cross between Phoenix and maybe like Las Vegas. Um, but it's a pretty fast track with a really neat outline. And um, I would like to see them go there, particularly as opposed to a track like New Hampshire, which I think is really boring. There's a lot sure. of boring tracks on the circuit, particularly this year. Um, Martinsville is usually exciting, but Brad swept all three stages this week and won. Yeah, the best part of Sunday's race was the burnout. <laughs> he did put an epic show on with that for sure. So, right, but if that's the most exciting part of a race, then there's a problem. Right, right. Yeah, that's um. Some of these, some seeing some of these shorter tracks come in into play later on. I think that was probably maybe in a response to what some of these fans have wanted to not have some of the larger tracks as the determining factor as it gets closer to the end of the season. 
But, um, I mean, a lot of this is looking at the from the perspective of what races can you do at short tracks that are still going to be um, at, a, at a decent temperature or decent weather that you can pull this off. Because as you start to get into the October and, and, and well, late September, early October in the northern states, um, you, you theoretically could run into snow in, in October and in, in, um, places like Pennsylvania and, and Michigan and stuff like that. So you're going to have to run those in, in either the early spring or I'm sorry, late spring, early summer. Um, cause you don't want to be going down to Texas and Florida and everything like that in the real, real hot months. Um, so it's very interesting to see how geography goes into play. So what, what my interesting thought was, I don't know if it's a positive or negative. We'll have to see, in my opinion, of the two weeks break that they take um, at the end of July and early August to see what that does to um, both the fans and the athletes and, and all the equipment. Um, it's, a, it's a pretty big gap being two weeks like that. And then... Um, and then to see it go into Pocono on a double header. Um, obviously, they've always been so close, so I guess they just decided let's just make it on the same weekend. Um, again, to me, it, it's cool. It's a different idea. I won't judge it until I see it. Um, but I guess in my preferences, I wish they would do something different than just run two races like back to back. It'd be more interesting to see how if like if you're going to do that, maybe connect them somehow. Like mm -hmm. stage one winner is the winner of the first race, and the the winner of the last race is the winner of the whole whole thing. Um, mm. But other than those two things, it and and I agree with you too. Like because because we could probably get to the Dover race and going to Dover in, in <laughs> August is going to be really hot. So I don't, I don't know if that's going to be so pleasant. We're going to shoot for the May 3rd race. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. Let's do that. Um, Talking about the uh, two week break, um, a, a couple weeks off, I think does make sense, but not necessarily for the drivers. Really. I think the drivers have one of the easiest jobs in NASCAR Sure. You know, it's it's the teams that work Tuesday through Sunday, and you know, the, yeah, the camera crews, the guys that install cameras, the guys that work at the track, you know, the whole the whole orchestration that goes into making a race happen every weekend. Those yep. are the guys that really deserve a little time off in the summer. Um, I mean, for lack of better words, you're the drivers. They got the easy job. Sure. They got, the, got air conditioned haulers and air conditioned RVs and. Yep. You know, granted, I wouldn't want to sit in a 140 degree car and for four hours and drive. <laughs> trip, but I mean, considering the money they win or get paid, plus, right? You know, all the amenities that are included. Sitting in a car for four hours really isn't that difficult. But, right. Um, yeah. I think for the production that goes into NASCAR, that's really where maybe a two week break is um, beneficial. Sure. Um, and sure. then talking about the, the double header at Phoenix, you're talking about connecting them. Uh, the Rolex 24 hour race in Daytona seems to be pretty popular. Um, yes. For fans of that type of racing. I wonder if maybe if they wanted to do a double header, maybe try and take it to a track that has lights and try like a 24 hour NASCAR race. That would, that would be yeah. unique. I would be down for that. That would be an endurance race. And, you know, this would this would have worked better back in the day when there were, you know, forty three cars and close to forty three different teams. But you know, you could have instead of Kyle Busch versus Joey Logano and Brad Keselowski, it could be Penske versus Gibbs versus Hendrick versus Yes um, as a team. Uh Stuart Haas versus Levine, you know, all the teams. Race. Now, it would suck for a one car team because that guy doesn't have any drivers to alternate with. <laughs> sure. But that could probably work something out for one weekend. I think that would be interesting because I like the 24 hour race. Yeah. Yeah. That would actually be, man, that's something we should totally pitch to somebody. Get in, uh, By the run list. all the four car teams run just two and they swap the drivers out after six hours. So they'll do a 12 hour stint maybe instead of 24. Each driver does six. And you run two cars on your whole team, so that would be awesome. It'd be a few fewer cars, but it'd be cool. 
Or you could run all 24 and have one driver run um, six hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's also true. Um, that would be cool. Uh, That'd be fun. So it, it might be something worth watching. I don't know. It's got to be better than Martinsville's race this weekend. Yeah, honestly, <laughs> I, I think if they were to do it, if they if they're pulling off Pocono, Pocono, I'm pretty sure has or could be set up for a road race. I I think. I don't quote mm-hmm. me on that. But I think it could be. That would be a cool place to do it. Is is run a road race for six hours or eight or something like that. Maybe a little longer. I don't know. And and try to road course it NASCAR style. I I would watch that. That actually sounds like an absolute sort of train wreck, but an awesome train wreck that I would want to watch. So a figure eight track. Oh yeah, there you go. There you go. Figure eight at 180. <laughs> so, all right. So, all these schedules this week we're running up to Texas or down mm-hmm. to Texas. Um, what do you got for your picks this week? Uh, unfortunately, based off the trends, it's going to just be more of the same. Uh, I yeah. tried to think outside the box a little bit, but it's kind of dumb to think outside the box when we have the same people at the top of the charts every week. Yeah. Um, so uh, looking at pole, the pole position, you know, he ran really well last weekend, almost won. I feel like he's going to be fast in Texas. I don't see him winning, but I think he'll be fast in Texas. I have Chase Elliott for the pole. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's a solid pick. <clears throat> um, I have Eric Almarola running at pole. The Fords just seem to be really fast on mm-hmm. on getting these poles. Uh, I mean, Logano's got it. Uh, what you call it? Uh, well, Blaney had it. Harvick had it. It's all Fords. Mm-hmm. So Almarola ran pretty strong in practice and almost qualified pretty high last week. So I, I picked Almarola for pole on this one. Okay, that's a good pick. <clears throat> Um, heading into stage one and stage two, I have the same winner for both stages. Uh, I think we're going to maybe start a new pattern this week and have the two stages swept, but a different pole winner and a different race winner. Okay. Um, I, I see Kevin Harvick going well this weekend, and we were talking before the show how he's kind of faded this year, and, but I, he is always there. I just don't think you're going to see him win as much this year. Um, but I think you're going to see him have some speed this weekend at sweep both stages. Okay. Yeah. And I can see that too. Cause again, it's, it's almost like we're looking at manufacturers rather than sometimes the drivers. Cause the, the Ford camp is strong. I, only Penske can, seems to be capitalizing on it though. Mm-hmm. Um, and I agree with you with the, the pull of being with Elliot with on the Chevrolet. I actually have Elliot as stage one. Mm-hmm. Um, cause he was, he ran second last week. I, I do see him as the strongest of the Hendrick bunch. Um, but then I do have a double in the, uh, in the, my pickings, but I picked Blaney for stage two because I think he is, he is just gonna, he's going to get a win like that. He's one of the only Fords on the Penske who, well, he's the only Ford on the Penske who didn't win yet. And that kid is just driving like mad. So, <laughs> yeah, I um, I kind of went a different direction with a winner this week. I don't know if it's because I think he'll actually win or because I want him to win, but this is this kind of track is going back to his bread and butter, and um, he actually has been. Well, last week wasn't very good, but overall he's been fairly solid this year. I think you'll see Kyle Larson break through. Okay. That's, yeah. And you know what's funny is, is he didn't even approach my radar. And that's actually a solid pick. Because he's he can get around that track. And you're right, that plays right into his advantage. And he can do this. I just, it's just going to be where. This is an easy track for him to pull this off in. Um, I, picked, I picked Blaney as the win. Just trying to go based on like looking at patterns of doubles between stages and wins. Um, so yeah, I got I got Blaney at that. But Larson is good. That's a good pick. I could see either one of them wearing the cowboy hats. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it both fits. They're both for their personalities. 
Larson's a little more mellow, but I can still see him doing it. Like, Looking he like pulled it off. Work. Yeah. <laughs> so who you got for long shot? Uh, well, this time last year, he would really definitely would not have been a long shot. But based on his performance so far this year, he's not exactly a solid pick. But um, he had some speed last weekend, and I feel like he's always kind of a threat. But uh, my long shot pick this weekend is Martin Church Jr. Okay. Yeah, he's he's getting in there. It's uh, it's gonna be interesting to see when his win comes too, because yeah. it's uh, it's inevitable. It's just it's yeah, it is. Some things to fine tune there first. Yes. Yeah. I feel like also, if he stays there longer than Carl Edwards or Daniel Suarez did, they'll have a little more time to get things nailed down. Yes, absolutely. He already has incredible momentum rather than those two did. Edwards did do well. I mean, Edwards at least won. So Mm -hmm. he's kind of has the the momentum that Edwards did. But he's already a past champion. He's got a lot of momentum already behind him. It's just going to be a matter of when, and then he'll hit his stride. Mm -hmm. Suarez was kind of like Eric Jones or... um... William Byron, they were just set the world. They just set the world on fire in um, yes in the nationwide series, and then once they got the cup, they just it's petered out. out. Yep. Um, and it, it, it's sad to see a lot of the drivers doing that. Like that's that's kind of the unfortunate part. Um, right. but and that man, that's a whole other show we should talk about at some point because like because you have the Kyle Busch running in all the other lower series and just absolutely dominating right. and i know he can't win the championships in those things but it's just like you know it proves how, how I, in my opinion it proves how good of a driver he is because mm-hmm. he can go and win in the top series just as much as he can win in the lower series where a lot of these little guys come up and they just destroy in the little series and cannot make anything happen in the large series so mm-hmm. it's uh I, I would believe more naysayers who don't like Kyle when some of the little drivers can actually come up and start competing at the level that Kyle can do. Right. So. Right. But that's just me. Um, my long shot is uh, the 17 car, Sun House. Oh, wow. What have you been smoking? I, I know, right? I'm always the whacked out one. I am. I am. But uh, he's a Ford. Fords have been pretty good. Yeah, he's aggressive. I think he's better than anything in the Hendrick camp. Um, Most likely. <laughs> uh, and, and and just just to pull a long shot, I, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. Like, we both talked. To Car- Larson's probably has one coming. Harvick has one coming. Elliott has one coming. Truex has one coming. Blaney's got one coming. There's five. So we got to pick somebody, or at least I got to pick somebody, who's not in that mix. And I just... I think Stenhouse could pull – he'll pull something out. I just don't know when. You, so. you could be right. I'm, I'm saving him for my long shot for more of the, like the super speedways, but you never know. You could be yeah, right. and that's that's a little bit probably more probable. Um, I would have picked uh, – I would have picked um, Johnson, but, you know, okay, I just – I swore I that I wouldn't do it, so I can't do it. I got to wait till Charlotte to pull Johnson back out, so uh, – <laughs> He's, he's going to wait. <laughs> but, oh. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That is our picks for Texas. Those are our opinions and thoughts on the new schedule. So, hopefully we kept this enjoyable, short, and fun. Let us know what you think. We'd love to know what you think about the new schedule and about some of these drivers. Uh, who do you think's on fire? Who's not? We might introduce a new topic in the next episode. So stay tuned. Thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.